Take another breath. Topic, our theme this month is wholeness. And my topic today is give spirit the last word. Give spirit the last word. There is something about my personality that I actually have forgotten about until this moment. (laughs) I used to insist on having the last word. Even if it was just a little mumble (laughs) up underneath in defiance. Where I couldn't just let it be. I remember my mother used to tell me, Deborah, you gotta you gotta pick your battles. You can't fight about everything all the time. She used to say that it was this whole joke, and the punchline of the joke was about this 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 cow that's trying to cross the railroad track but doesn't quite make it in time. And, and, and the punchline in it is that, is that I admire your spunk, but I don't think too much of your judgment. <laughs> so I used to hear that one a lot with the last word. But give spirit the last word. And, and what I mean by the last word is that final seal. like where the record stands, so to speak. Not just some icing on top, but the last word being what's going to point to what's next. You hear me say all the time, there are at least two sides to every story, and then what? There's the truth. There's the truth. The truth doesn't have sides. Truth doesn't have sides. Truth is transcendent of sides. Conflict doesn't arise from differences of opinion. Conflict is polarization around the differences of opinion. And in our social political environment, I cannot say that enough. Differences of opinion in and of themselves do not cause conflict. The conflict is the polarization around the differences. So instead of you spending so much time trying to figure out each other's differences, or how can you make your difference so distinct, that they'll understand you. Ooh, (laughs) TKO in the row over there, total knockout. instead Instead of spending so much time trying to perfect your side, notice the polarization. I was an expert at perfecting my side. I was a debater. That's what you did. My mother was a debater. You get all the facts, you get everything together, and I would rehearse the arguments. I would rehearse arguments I hadn't even had yet. (laughs) They're gonna say this, and I'm gonna say, I'm telling you, I was rehearsing the arguments. And then I began to realize that I got to have all those arguments because I was preparing for them. (laughs) And see, the crazy thing about my house, with everybody debating, that when you debate, you don't know which side you're going to argue. It's a flip of the coin. So you have to be prepared to argue either side. And I'm actually glad for that training because I can see the other side. I can see the other side without polarizing around it. 
I was trained to be able to see the other side enough to actually argue it if I had to. And I can. I can argue the side that is diametrically opposed to what I personally believe. Because I can see it. Are you with me? It doesn't mean I have to agree with it, but I can see it. And somehow or another, we have gotten into this idea that if I even so much as understand you, I'm colluding with you. That if I even so much as listen to you, this is true in interpersonal relationships as much as on global relationships. That somehow or another, the way that I keep my integrity is to be so separate from you, to distinguish myself from you. That's not wholeness. We're talking about wholeness. And if we let spirit have the last word, that means we have to get up off of having the last word. To give it to spirit, it means we don't have it. I'm humble enough now to know I don't know. I don't know. I have my opinions, but life is bigger than what my opinions are. Are you with me? It's bigger than that. And what God sees includes everybody. The truth is big enough for everybody. Okay. I'm not saying that you shouldn't feel directly into wherever you are. It's not what I'm saying. Be fully present with you. Have an opinion. Because if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Know where you stand, have values, have all that, but don't be so entrenched in it that it makes you intransigent. Don't be so entrenched in it that you are rigid and can't hear, that, that you can't have some compassion, that you can't see something other than what's yours. Wholeness. Giving spirit the last word. In the sacred yes, which is a collection of those spirit letters that I get, there's one line that I really like. It says, it's talking to us as human beings, it says, just because you're not in control doesn't mean things are out of control. Do you feel that? Just because you're not in control doesn't mean it's out of control. And that's our big fear, that somehow if I'm not manipulating it and I'm not controlling it, that somehow or another it's not all going to work out. Mm -mm. So I went to my spirit definitions about wholeness. Hardcores, get your pens out. <laughs> They're already ready. <laughs> get your pens out, because I'm going to give you two. And just as a reminder, these spiritual qualities are always the essence of who we are. It's essence, it's, it's spirit, it's, it's, it's energetic fields and vibrations. It's places and spaces in the universe. It's not activity, and they are not objects. Okay? Love isn't something that you can get. You've got to be it to experience it. You know, faith isn't something that you get. Faith is a verb. It's not a noun. It's not something that you can chase after and get. You have to be it. You got to be it. 
So it says about wholeness, and, and, and the way that these formulas go is that in order for us to experience these spiritual qualities, which are the essence of who we are, there's some shift in consciousness that has to happen. There's something that's already here that we're just not paying attention to. There's something we have to bring to the table, and it shows what it is we have to do with what we have with what's already here to experience that spiritual quality. For example, it defines a miracle. It says a miracle is where your deep intent meets my inexhaustible supply. A miracle is where your deep intent meets my inexhaustible supply. Hence the name of the second volume of that series is Your Deepest Intent. There is an inexhaustible supply. And most of us are busy trying to make the supply. But that's not our job in the equation of the miracle. Our job in the equation of the miracle is bring the intent. Bring the intent where we're putting it all together, our actions, our words, our deeds, our thoughts, our emotions, our motivations, the processes that we're using, that all of that is going in the same direction. See, that we're in the power of intent class now. Um, some of us here are studying with me. It, when it's all going in the same direction, when you're at the, it, it's not a desire. Intent's not a goal. It's this place of energetic place where you're all moving in the same direction, when no is no longer an answer. When no's not an answer. And each of us has those moments when we are so sure. We're not, we don't know how it's going to happen or all the wherefores, but we just know within our bones, as it says in Scripture, if you have faith and do not doubt. It's not just the faith, but don't doubt. This doesn't mean you can't question. It doesn't mean that you can't try on this thing or that thing. Linguistically speaking, the word doubt that's used in Scripture in, in Greek, the root word is separate. You hear me say all the time, the only thing that needs to be healed is just a sense of separation. To doubt is to separate. This have faith and do not doubt doesn't mean don't question. Don't separate from what you do know. You don't have to know everything, but don't separate from what you do know. Think about this. When we get into the hard times, is that not what we do? Because there's so much that we don't know, we fail to stand in what we do know. We stop claiming what we do know. The love that we do know, the health that we do know. The, the, the legacy of spirit pulling through for us time and time again, we know it. But we get in these pickles and act like we don't know what we know. Don't separate from what you do know. Can you feel that? You don't have to know more. If you have faith, you don't have to know more. Just hold on to what you got. Stand there. Stand there. So it says about wholeness. It says, wholeness is where your presence abides. I'm just going to stop right there before I even finish the rest of it. Wholeness is where your presence abides. Oh, isn't that a beautiful image? To abide. Most of us in the room have a residence. And we go there back and forth, but we're not abiding there. We're not really living in our houses. We eat there. 
we sleep there, we do all these kinds of things. Well, most of us are actually outside of our house more than we're in the house on a day-to-day -day basis. Are you with me? Okay. So we have a resonance, but that's not where your presence abides. Your presence is not inside your residence 24-7. Are you with me? Your presence is abiding somewhere. To abide is to dwell on a continuous basis. And the place where your presence dwells is not a location. It's not a geographic spot. The bigness of your presence is wherever you are. You take you with you wherever you are. Okay, so, so think about this. In order to have your whole, the, this sense of wholeness, you have to choose. You have to choose where you're gonna live. You have to choose where you're gonna dwell. To experience wholeness, you have to choose what you're gonna do with your presence. Your presence. That's the all of you. Are you with me? So it's saying we got to do something with it. Where, where is it going to abide? It says if you want to experience wholeness, your presence has to abide somewhere. It says your presence, wholeness, is where your presence abides. And I'm going to break this down in my unencumbered integration. Mm. Wholeness is where your presence abides in my unencumbered integration. God, the universe, it's integrated, unencumbered. Unencumbered. Ooh, that's a strong word. So I spent a chunk of my life as a lender in the real estate uh, industry. And that's one of the places where we hear the term encumbered a lot. When you encumber something, you put a lien on it. When you encumber something, it's no longer free and clear. It's burdened with a debt when something is encumbered, okay? And, and the debt doesn't have to be just a financial debt. Haven't you been in relationships where you have felt encumbered <laughs> by that relationship or encumbered by that job? There's not free motion anymore. There's not free will. When it's encumbered, you can't just go and do anything that you want to do with it you are saddled to and connected to something else that you also have to satisfy. So you're constantly having to meet some other conditions. You're constantly having to pay up or do something. It, it, yes, technically it's your house. You have uh, uh, the title to it, but, but the bank's got the deed. Like you buy a car, and you, your name is on the registration, but Toyota got the pink slip. Okay, they got the pink slip. Okay. And no matter whether the car works, doesn't work, Toyota wants their money. Okay. You can't just go and sell that car and take the money out until you pay Toyota off. Okay. That's an encumbrance. That's an encumbrance where it's sticky stuff. There's debt, emotional, physical, financial. There's some kind of way it's not clean and pure. But Spirit is saying that God's integration don't have sticky stuff. 
God's integration done owe nothing to nobody. That nobody has priority. That there's nothing that's going on in the external world that is, is, is inhibiting one iota what it is that God can do. And that if you want to experience wholeness, your presence has to abide in an integration of the divine that's unencumbered. Unencumbered. No stories. No, no nothing else on it. No drama. No history. No nothing that's going to prevent you from feeling the integration. Oh, so let's talk about this integration. So I looked at, well, what was the definition that the spirit voice gave for integration? Oh, it's a doozy. And then I want to put these together. And then I want to talk about what's happening on the global and the macro level. I'm talking about on the micro. We're going to go on the macro. Because it's all the same stuff. So it describes integration like this. It says, integration is when your complexities, listen to that, not our contradictions, our complexities, all our variety, all of our diversity within your own self, within us in the world, are you with me? It's when our complexities coalesce. When, when, when you coalesce, you merge in with a coalition. You're, you're working together when you coalesce. It says integration is when your complexities coalesce with my divine order. With my divine order, that when there's integration, all of the disparate parts, all of it is merging into a divine order. The word integration, the root word is integer, which means whole. In math, the integers are the whole numbers. One, two, three. No fractions. No fragments. The whole numbers. When you integrate that is the state of bringing all of those pieces together. Integrity is living in a state of integration. It's not just about ethics or morality. Integrity is when it all comes together. Whenever you think something's in it, not in integrity, it's because you feel like all of the pieces aren't quite working together. <laughs> that this thing is saying this, but it's doing this over there. It's not coming together. Are you with me? So this place of wholeness, this place of wholeness is when we choose to let our very presence abide. Abide in this, 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 this place where all of the complexities are merging in with the divine order in an unencumbered way. Oh, this is the society. This is where we got to go. This has got to go. Where our presence is living and it is inviting in all of the complexities, knowing that all of the complexities are coming together in some kind of a divine order, whether you can see it or not. And in a truly unencumbered way. I'm getting a flash now of uh, one of my spoken word pieces. It's on the, um, the Singing the Sacred Yes CD. It's a really good piece. It goes on about 10 minutes, and it's got a good musical jam underneath it. And it crescendos, and it crescendos, and at the peak part of the crescendo, I won't peak it there for you because it'll blow you out, but, <laughs> but it, says, it says, all this playing judge and jury, causing such a fury, taking a toll, digging a hole, putting an immoral mortgage on our souls, which we, the debt of which we can no longer pass on to our children to pay. That with all of the divisiveness that we're doing, we are encumbering our souls. We're putting a mortgage on our souls and making our children pay the debt. Yeah. 
Somebody's got to pay off the encumbrance. The midterm elections are coming up in 2018. Vote. Vote. Vote like your life depended on it. Vote like the planet depends on it. Was it just, I think it was just last Saturday, or a week ago, Saturday, when I spoke at the Poor People's Campaign rally um, down at Loudon Nelson. And I was saying that if for some reason you don't think you know, it's important for you to vote, then do it for somebody else. Do it for the ancestors who died so you can vote. Do it for the people too young to vote, whose future we are encumbering. Do it for the people incarcerated or, or incapacitated in some kind of way who can't vote. Do it for the rest of the world. For all the U.S. citizens who don't want to vote, for every one of us, there's 100,000 people from another country who would do anything to cast a vote here. Yes, there's an urgency of now, but I want to make it very plain. I am not being reactionary to this moment. I entered into the political science program at USC in 1972. As a sophomore, I was in the, the honors program for seniors. We studied the theory of revolutions. And I wasn't but 17. I came out with economics as well, but, but, but what I'm saying is that I care passionately. Politics is a social science, and it is the science of how people organize themselves in community. Economics is a social science. It is the science of what people do with their resources. I am passionate about people. I am passionate about community. I am passionate about how we organize together in community. I've been an activist all of my life. My comments now aren't just about a political party or about what's happening just specifically now. But what is so critical now is the way that we are slipping away from a sense of wholeness. No. No. We can have differences of opinion, but you don't have to polarize. You don't have to polarize. If you look at the Supreme Court, and I know I mentioned this not too long ago, um, Judge Ruth uh, Ginsburg, there was a beautiful story about her life. There are a couple of movies that are coming out, and the one called RBG. And I love seeing the footage. Now, she's known for obviously being one of the more liberal progressives. And Scalia was always on the other side with the most conservative. They are best friends. They're best friends. They go to the theater together, and their families hang out together. They're best friends. There's a reason why we have differing opinions. So we have a democracy and not fascism. 
There's a reason why you want differing opinions around you. Because it will be more representative of the people. And if you have diverse opinions at the table, you are more likely to come up with something that can serve more people. Are you with me? I am talking about a deep intent for wholeness. A deep intent in wholeness. And that's what I'm asking you to vote for. To vote your conscience. To vote for what brings us more connected. What brings us more connected. We're connected to the planet. Hear her cry. Hear her cry. We are connected to the planet. Global warming exists. And human beings do play a part in it. You can disagree about facts, but you can't create your own. You can disagree about facts, but we are living in a dangerous time now. Where not only are we not listening to spiritual truth, we're not even listening to human truth. A free press is not the enemy of the people. And if it weren't for the advent recently of the internet, we couldn't even have the kind of stuff that we're having now. Because if you wanted to reach the public, you had to go through the press. You had to go through them. I'm deeply concerned. I know that God is in control. I also know that drama is optional. And I know we're creating a lot of optional drama. <laughs> Vote. Vote. So many things are hanging on a thread. Education, health care, immigration, economics. I mean, I could just, like, the list just goes on and on and on. Vote your conscience for wholeness. Said integration is where our complexities coalesce with divine order. David, I was deeply moved by your story that you shared with us in the opening. And beginning to see how all of those things that seem to be so different about you and odd about you was part of God's divine order. part of God's divine order. And just two days ago, when I did that eulogy for my aunt, I got a big family. And there were all kind of people who were there from my childhood and my background. But I stood in a different spot. And were all of the different things that might have made me estranged from the church or, 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 or estranged from my family. It's like it coalesces into a divine order. That's who I am. Are, are you with me? And it's like for the first time in my life, I felt like I belonged. Yeah. 
I just figured it out this moment. I knew it was different. I knew that something happened. I didn't know what it was, and I've been, but that's it. It's like for the first time, I felt like I really belonged in my family, in my extended family, and in the church, and in all of it, and in the community, and all of that simultaneously. Are you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. There's the wholeness that's there. When, <laughs> when we went to the funeral home, not the funeral home, we went to the cemetery, and uh, I hadn't even realized that I was going to be doing it. I wound up <laughs> doing most of this stuff, but I was the only minister there. Uh, <laughs> Everybody didn't go. It was just the family that, that went. So I don't know, it was maybe 40 of us or something like that. And, <laughs> and I get there, and, and the guy from the cemetery looks at me. They're introducing me, and I said, yes, I'm Reverend Johnson. And he just did like this. And he said, oh, well, I've never seen a woman. And all I heard was woman. And, and I just tuned him out. It was, like, it was like, that's your problem, not mine. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not going to make that my problem. Yeah. I knew who I am. And because you have not had the pleasure. <laughs> because you haven't had the pleasure of working with a female reverend. This is your lucky day. <laughs> I forgot which one of his daughters, but as, as Barack Obama was leaving the White House, President Obama, one, he, he was in a speech and he quoted one of his daughters saying to him, do you, Daddy. <laughs> Just do you. <laughs> Don't worry about all what everybody else is doing and all of their differences. Do you. Bring you to the table. Bring all of your passion, all of your intent, all of your vision to the table. Don't cower down worrying about all what they're doing. You bring you. And when all of us bring all of us to the table, then it's on. See? All that imbalanced thing that's going on, it won't happen. When all of us bring all of us to the table. And then let it go. Listen to what I'm saying. And then let it go. It's no more than what happened. I'm, I'm ending now. Like a family or, or, or couples counseling or something. And you're there. This is how I feel. This is how I feel. And, and you're listening to each other and you're hearing it. And then you have to let it go. Yes? You got to let it go. And you can't keep beating up the other person with your side, beating up the rest of the nation with your side, beating up the party with your side. You let it go. So that something can emerge out of this that is a benefit to all. I don't want you to go to the polls to win. I want you to go to the polls out of love. I want you to go to the polls out of love for this nation and our soul to redeem it, to bring something back. When I was doing the eulogy and, and, I, and I was riffing off of something that my cousin said about, about my auntie. She was a teacher, in fact, she and my mother team taught the last 20 years of their career. And she had this way 
that she was firm, but she was never judgmental. And she would just say, oh, now you know you can do better. You know you can do better. And if it was really off, she'd just say, now that's not even you. That's not you. You can do better. And I said to the audience, you see the difference in that? Now, oh, you're so stupid, and you're just... That's not even you. Can you feel what I'm saying? This stuff that's going on now, it's like, yes, it is our pain, and it, but the soul of this nation is so much better than this. Can we rise to that occasion? I'm not saying ignore what's going on, but just like with health, look through it. Where's the health when your body is ill? It's in that same body. But unless you claim the health in the midst of the illness, you'll never experience the health. It's the same thing with this nation. We are riddled with disease. See the health through and beyond the disease and call it for it. Don't talk to me about all the cancer. Call forth the health inside of the cancer. Don't talk about all the confusion and the judgment. Call forth the clarity even in the midst of it. That's what I'm asking you to do. That's what I'm asking you to do. When I spoke in Atlantic City in August, there was a huge tribute to Della Reese. She was part of the New Thought denomination that was holding this conference, the Universal uh, Foundation for Better Living. And one of the things she was most famous for was her role in, as Tess in um, Touched by an Angel. And in this one episode, they bring out uh, it's a story about a, a, a young guy who's being bullied. And he's going to get tough. And he's learning how to box. And he's just angry. He's a little scrawny little guy. And he's just pissed. And they bring out Muhammad Ali. He has Parkinson's. And Tess does the speaking for him. Like he says something, but you can't really make it out. And what Muhammad Ali tells this, this young guy, he's maybe like 13, if you're not fighting out of love, it's just a fight. Let us pray. as we turn within. Stealing away the inner chamber, the upper room. The secret place of the most high. Our dwelling. The real us is in the world, but not of the world. We're in the world, but we're not from the world. We go home. We go home. The real us has never been hurt or harmed or damaged in any way, never been molested or abused, never been broke or her, or sick. The real us is transcendent of all of that. And it's knocking at our hearts and saying, let me be. Let me be. We don't encumber it with our stories. Here we are, God, naked. Use us with all the complexities 
With all this stuff we like and don't like and the people we like and don't like, here we are naked. Transform us. Transform us. Oh, Mother, Father, God, you're like the, the cosmic compost pile. And we just take all of it, all of our crap, and you turn it into fertilizer. All of it, all the manure in our life, and you turn it into fertilizer to cultivate what's next. So we have the courage in the moment to take all that stuff that we're trying to get rid of and we put it on the cosmic compost pile. Sometimes called the altar. We lay it upon the altar to allow the alchemy of the divine to transform and to transmute it into all needs met. So as we pray in this moment, we're knowing that the Holy Spirit, the divine, is unencumbered. It doesn't need any of our stuff. not that it comes from the nothing it comes from the no thing where's the good going to come from from wherever it is now and we give thanks for that divine circulation that's taking place all needs men like manna from heaven like the loaves and the fishes all needs madness all of them so we get into gratitude now we're not even begging a, a distant God to make some stuff happen. We're just rejoicing because we see it done. We feel the health. We feel the wholeness. We feel the, the, the joy. We feel the peace. We feel the prosperity and the abundance. We feel it. We see it. We see the civility. We see being on the right track. Good global citizens. Loving and supporting our allies. <laughs> Loving and supporting the, the constellation of countries that come together to create peace. Protecting the planet. Oh God, give us the courage, the strength, the wherewithal, and the will to do thy will. Thank you for blessing this community and not encumbering us with a whole lot of hierarchy so we can speak the truth and live the truth and be the truth and multiply it back in our own respective communities. Thank you, God, for all needs met, including our divine new right residence. Oh, I feel it and it's good. Thank you, God. We get out of the way. We allow it to be. And so it is. Amen. Amen. And amen. <laughs>